All right, we are ready. This is our very first Micro School South Florida online info meeting. So thank you very much for joining us. So tonight, um, since it's our very first one, I thought it would be fun to invite Melissa Landis from uh, Lake Worth Waterkeeper and also Lagoonies. Uh, she kind of helped get the Micro School South Florida started. And um, I have myself presenting as well from Tapestry Academy. And we have Tobin Slavin from Acton Academy in Fort Lauderdale. He's going to be sharing a little bit about what he does. Um, I just wanted to sh share a little bit about what Micro School South Florida is. It was kind of an idea that I had about a year ago, right when I should have been prepping for school in August. I thought, do you know what would be a really great idea? How's about if we start a website so people can know what micro schools are? Just felt like nobody knew what that word even was. And that way I thought we could connect together and share. I'm always getting phone calls about, hey, do you know somebody that lives? And it's an hour away. Of course, that's not feasible to drive an hour away to go do somebody's school option. So I thought, let's start connecting together and then we can share resources and information. And it ended up turning out to be a really great idea. And today I just checked, we have over a hundred people who have joined the website. So that's kind of fun considering I really didn't do much with it. Uh, when I first started, I did. And then it just kind of incubated for a while and now it's starting to take off again. So that's really exciting. So the idea for tonight is to have, um, there's three of us tonight. One of our people wasn't able to make it. They had an emergency come up. So we will let them present at another time. But the idea is to have uh, the three of us share maybe five to seven minutes about what we offer through our micro school or program. And then um, we will do, uh, let's see, some guided questions about micro schooling. The topic for tonight is, if I can find it, the topic is non-traditional education versus traditional education. Figure that way we could introduce parents in the area to a little bit more about what non-traditional education is, that we can be connected more with other like-minded educators and just get more people talking about this, you know, start the conversation. So we are going to, let's see, who would we like to go first? Anyone up for the challenge? <laughs> We've got Tobin, go for it. Yeah, I, I don't mind jumping in. It might, it might fit actually, because um, thinking about tonight's session, um, you know, putting together some, some thoughts about this, I, I mostly focused on your big question, Candy, what, which is why even take this path? Who might be interested and why might you take this non-traditional path? So I'm happy to talk about act in or answer questions as much as anyone wants to hear that. But I think what I really came to bring was a discussion about one big idea. And I think it affects all of us, whether it's, you know, act in or tapestry or any, any other micro school, uh, when families are looking for options. So does that make sense for everyone? I'll start there. Yes. Sounds yeah. perfect. I'm going to, I, I don't do a lot of slides. I'm much more interested in dialogue conversations, but I do have a couple that I'm gonna show you uh, just to illustrate this big idea. Uh, Candy, can you turn on your screen sharing? Oh, yes, of course, sorry about that. And I will give credit. The, I uh, borrowed a couple of these from Tyler Thigpen, if you guys know him, he's in the Acton network. So I wanna give credit where it's due. Um, this big picture that you can see, um, you know, if you think about medicine on the far left, you're seeing, you know, the 1900s, 1950s, basically the last hundred years, and you can visually see the change that we've all been experiencing. Uh, communication, same thing, like worlds of change. And now we have these amazing computers that we walk around with in our hands or in our pockets. Even the world of work has changed dramatically. Um, but the one thing that hasn't changed is this is what school looked like, you know, hundred years ago. This is what it looked like 50 years ago. And I think you guys pretty much know, you know, what it looks like today. Um, th there's not a lot different there. 
And I think if I'm a family out there and we're one, we are one of these families, uh, we have five children, but one of them school age right now, nine-year-old daughter, folks are looking for options. They're looking for something different. And there are some really great options out there. There are private schools, there are charter schools, there are religious schools. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I have a lot of good friends that work in public school systems as well, and they're doing everything that they can. I feel like they don't have the freedoms that we, we do in the alternative school market, um, but everybody wants and knows there's a need for change. They need something different. And that's what led us down this path. Uh, we were unschooling our, our then, um, we, we were kind of doing the digital nomad thing during the pandemic. And we were unschooling at the time because of that. And uh, with the pandemic, we ended up in South Florida and we decided to open a school. And in, in a million years, I never thought that would be our story. Um, part of the reason why is because I came from education. My master's degree was, I was trained to be a school administrator and I left education 20 years ago saying, I will never go back, I'm done. <laughs> um, and I've been an entrepreneur for the last 15 or 20 years. But uh, there, there are several things that drew me into this space. Um, one of them was this idea of when you look at this, you know, I showed you how the world has changed in the last hundred years and we don't see those kinds of changes in the educational space. I'm not sure you can take existing education uh, and, and revolutionize it. I think you almost have to start with a blank sheet of paper. And that, to me, that's what a lot of the micro schools are doing. They're, they're just doing really interesting things. They started with a, you know, if we started from scratch, you know, what could this school look like? Could it be in our home? Could it be in a bus? You know, like what, what could we do that would be amazing uh, for our learners and prepare them for a world that really doesn't exist yet? You know, the jobs that they're going to work probably haven't even been invented in some cases, or they may, the, the numbers, the research shows that they'll probably work five or six different, uh, uh, what do they call it? Like a mini career. You, there won't be one you won't go and work in one corporation for you know, 40, 50 years and get your gold watch at the end. There'll, there'll probably be career shifts that happen because of, often because of these changes in technology around us. So how do we prepare for that world that isn't fully baked yet? And one, one of the ways is, is to create these uh, environments that are really exciting because you know, there's uh, project-based learning, there's uh, social emotional learning and all the, all the good stuff that we probably remember from our own school experiences, like there were those special moments and special days. I think what I see in the alternative, the micro school market is days that are jam packed with that stuff because you can get the academics done in a really smart, intelligent way, often uh, enabled by some of the technology that's up there. And that's one of the big differences. There's, there's great tools uh, in ACT and we like to say we're, we're collecting more data in our environment than has ever been possible before, like different data points of where a learner is on their different skills. We're collecting so many, you know, multiple data points each day and gathering it. I mean, how can you compare that with sending home a report card every couple of months and having a parent teacher conference? So um, a lot of different options, a lot of great options out there. Uh, Acton is different. I think the, the way we talk about acting and what's most important to what we're doing differently is that they're learner driven. And for us, that means it's actually in the name. The, so Acton, A-C-T-O-N, actually I can show you. I, I think I even put it on a slide, which wasn't my intended focus, but I think the last one, there you go. So you can see our name, A-C-T-O-N. Uh, it comes from Lord John Acton. And uh, kind of, you know, when I heard that, like the name, it was a little bit of a turnoff to me. It seems really old and like, what's the relevance? Like, here's, here's what Learner Driven is and here's what the relevance of that name is. Lord John Acton is the guy who said, uh, power tends to corrupt, right? And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And what that means is that when any of us, it's just human nature, when you find yourself in a position where you're in power and you're making decisions for other people, it's just, again, human nature that it starts to corrupt. And we, we rob uh, people of freedoms and opportunities, even when we don't intend to. So in an Acton Academy, learner-driven means there are no teachers, 
there are adults, we call them guides, but there's no one teaching in the school. It's peer to peer learning. And every single job in the school is in the process of being pushed to the learners. So for example, up in um, uh, Virginia, uh, uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia, uh, I was on a call this week with one of the owners up there. Uh, she runs multiple campuses. So over a hundred learners, two adults, uh, the, the high school that they're, which is called a launch pad that is running, a 16 year old has the keys. She shows up in the morning, she opens the door and starts school. The adults are in the building only because their um, Spark and Deliver uh, uh, Discovery Studios are also in the same building. They basically don't even go into the high school space unless they're asked by the high schoolers to come in and sort of answer a question or you know provide resources. Otherwise, every single job from you know uh, uh, core skills to freedom levels to uh, planning field trips and bringing in speakers, everything that happens in the school is being, at that point, it has been pushed to the learners. And not only are those high schoolers, those launch patterns, administering their own education, but they're actually for service hours, they're coming down and running the middle and the elementary schools. So it's a, it's a really different model. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's for everyone. Um, for our family, when we read the Courage to Grow book, which is sort of the book that's out there that folks that are aware of the Acton story, most, mostly it's through that book. When we read that book, our experience was, uh, again, we were unschooling our daughter at the time, was uh, we, we, wouldn't, we, didn't, we wouldn't go another direction. Knowing this exists, we were either going to put our daughter in an Acton Academy, which meant moving into an area where it was available, or we decided to start one. Um, so here we are. That's exciting. I still remember how exciting it felt when I discovered there was something new and it's like your brain just won't turn off. It just keeps yeah. going, going, going. How am I going to get this to work? And anyway, my husband can attest to this. He's like, <laughs> please, when can we talk about something other than education? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a, for us, it's a family project. My wife is the head of school. Um, I still work full time, but uh, am more active in the school than than probably as healthy some days as you as you guys describe. Uh, but it's a family project. Our our daughters uh, in it. Uh, my oldest daughter. We have five children total. My oldest daughter is actually one of our guides in the school, um, so we're enjoying it. And um, I'm happy to answer questions. I don't think I'm not sure how helpful it is to just talk about acting stuff, but I think the space is really interesting. And I think there are some differences about why we do things, uh, to my knowledge, like th there's a lot of really cool things going. Obviously, we do project based learning as well. Social most emotional learning is a big part of what we're doing. Um, you know, we talk about learning, learning to be learning to do learning to learn our all that stuff has to happen first before the academics, like when you get the foundational pieces, the, the academics become a rocket ship and take off from there. But uh, mostly I wanted to have a conversation. I'd love to hear what you guys are thinking. What, what options are you looking at? What are you looking for? What are you finding or not finding out there? And how can I be a resource? Because um, one of the things that we did uh, when I joined the Acton Net, when we joined the Acton Network, we actually started a, uh, a Florida owners group. So there's 10 of us here in the state of Florida. I'm, I know the other owners. Uh, we meet on a regular basis. And so you know, if someone's in a community and wants to make a connection to an act in near you, I'm happy to make an introduction or provide any resources that way. Sounds great. Thank you, Tobin. So for those of you who are new to joining us, that was Tobin Slavin from Acton Academy in Fort Lauderdale. He is opening a new Acton Academy down there, and we actually joined him for his children's business fair in December. It was an amazing experience. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, we have another one. I will I oh, will yeah, plug in. We have another children's business fair coming up uh, June 11th, and I actually have a couple spots open. So if you have a young person who wants that entrepreneurial experience and they're willing to hustle to make it happen in a couple of weeks, uh, I could still get them in. We're closing uh, at the end of this week, our applications. Excellent. That was what? Saturday, June 11th, same yeah. day as our micro school showcase and expo. <laughs> Lots of things going on before everyone heads off for the summer. All right, Melissa, are you ready and willing to go next? Okay, sure. our next speaker. Can I ask a quick question? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Susie. 
uh, you were talking about um, at your at the academy. A lot of it is focused first and foremost on like the social and the emotional, you know, base stability and everything. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah. So I think that um, the best way I would describe it is we feel like we're incubating a tiny civil society. So one of the first things that happens when learners come into an Acton Academy is they they create contracts with each other. And the contracts are pretty simple when you're, you know, when you're, um, uh, we call them spark level age, but like kindergarten level when you're starting school. At that level, it might just be, you know, be kind to one another, be respectful, make sure you pick up after yourself, don't hit other people over the top of the head, right? That, that could be a very simple contract, but Maybe, everything yeah. is contracted, there are um, consequences, there are responsibilities and roles. And so all of, there's a lot of time, I think for, the, we're very selective uh, about the families that we even take on because if someone doesn't understand these, th these differences about an Acton Academy, most likely um, the owners are gonna say, we can't serve you at this time. So for example, in, in our school, if folks haven't read Courage to Grow and we can't have a conversation about that, then we're not enrolling them because there's just, it's just too big a difference. And they're, sooner or later, there's going to be like a parent that comes in and says, well, what, you know, why, where's my child on their math scores or whatever in the first couple of weeks? That's just the wrong question for us. But again, we're building that foundation because once the, once that foundation is in place and they play well together and they're respectful and they're able to do these amazing, like unbelievable Socratic discussions. And then you find out a nine-year-old's like leading the whole thing. Um, there's an example in the book of, of one of those. Uh, it, then, then the academics take off and they're jumping like two to three grade levels uh, for every nine months. So, you know, I just put together a blog post on our website about what the end, end product looks like when you're graduating because Actons have been around a dozen years now. So they're the, the earliest students are graduating and in, in really, you know, some of them going on to higher education, some of them bypassing higher ed because they're getting uh, six figure offers right out of high schools. And there's, there's reasons why that's true, but um, it's, I, I think going back to academics is only part of the picture. And if folks are really heavily focused on, I would need to get my child into uh, you know, Princeton or Harvard or whatever, that it's probably, they're just probably not going to be the right fit for what we're doing. No, that makes total sense. Thank you. It was great. Thanks. Thanks, Susie, for a question. Love that participation. All right, Melissa, we'll let you take it away. So Melissa is an amazing educator and instructor and all kinds of things. So she's with Lake Worth Auto, uh, Water Keepers and Lagoonies, and we'll let her share what she has to offer. Go ahead. Yeah, at some point I'll use the share screen also, but um, I really was really liking what Tobin was saying in the beginning there, especially with how education has not changed uh, over time. Um, it's I'm in the process of getting my PhD in sustainable education, and that's pretty much the conversation that I'm I'm we're doing my work around is is this held belief of what education should look like and what it is and what it should be versus um, education for today and tomorrow and what that could look like. And um, I too believe that the system that we currently have, you can't, we lose a lot of what's really great about alternative education when we try to stick it in the current system. So it might take us reinventing what that looks like and what it could be. And that's kind of the basis for a lot of the work that I do. I work with Lake Worth Waterkeeper and it is a nonprofit in Palm Beach County, uh, kind of overseeing the watershed of Palm Beach County, which goes from Lake Okeechobee all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. And um, our watershed is a part of the greater watershed that is the Everglades and takes up pretty much all of Florida. So we talk about all sorts of things, but um, I just want to do a quick... I, jam-packed a ton of information on a few slides, but I do want to focus on um, a program that we're starting in the fall in particular. So, ooh, I can share screen. Uh, let's do this. They're not very fun slides because I just um, put them together real fast, but Lake Worth Waterkeeper um, started as mostly just water sampling in the beginning. 
and um, the owner, Ronaldo Diaz, he would go out into the Lake with Lagoon and sample to look for bacteria in the water. And we still, that's still a pretty big part of what we do today. We do uh, weekly samples around Lake with Lagoon and we started freshwater lakes. Uh, recently, we also do uh, advocacy and policy work um, because his background is in environmental law. And so this is one of the, the projects that he was working on to help um, kind of get this crazy thing out of the way because it was destroying some of the habitat in the area. And uh, finally, education, uh, which is where I live, uh, myself and actually Alex, who's on this uh, program here down here. She's one of my other facilitators. And I do heavily emphasize facilitator over teacher um, because as a facilitator, there is more of a reciprocal uh, interaction instead of a lecture based that you would normally see in a classroom style. Um, my background's in experiential education. Um, so it's been really interesting to kind of see the differences between experiential education, um, being a student facilitator in my college experience and uh, how detached that is from the way our educational system currently works and doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, so I wanted to create something new and different and a lot of the work that we do, um, I've used other models to kind of create and put together some programs for Lake Worth Waterkeeper. One of my big inspirations is Green School Bali because they do uh, a lot of, they have Wallace classrooms, their whole building is made out of bamboo from the area. Most of their classes are very local based. So our programs are very local based. If we believe if people are learning about things in their own backyard, then they'll learn um, to take care of it better. They'll build a relationship with it, they'll care about it and they'll want to protect it. So we do start locally on our information um, and give it context and develop activities that are hands-on project-based. Um, so our major program is called the Goonies. It's a 10 week program. We meet once a week, ages five to 11, uh, Jupiter Lake Worth area. And this fall, we will be meeting Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm gonna go through these ones fairly fast just so you can kind of see all the different things that we're doing. Um, we do have a summer camp, which is this, this kind of the lineup for that camp. So the way Lagoonies works is it's kind of an overview of the different places in Palm Beach County. Uh, each place lends itself to its own lessons. So if we go to Hypoluxo scrub natural area, we're gonna obviously talk about the scrub and the animals and plants that live there. We're also gonna talk about how it affects the uh, watershed and our place within the scrub and how we affect the scrub and our watershed. So not only are we talking about these individual habitats, we're bringing it all together to talk about our impact and how it plays a role in the larger system of what Florida is both locally and globally. We have a family summer series that are mostly free except for two of them. One is at Okahili and the other is a kayak trip, but the rest of them are free activities for families over the course of the summer. All this information is on our website. We're starting a fishing club. It starts this Saturday. It'll meet every fourth Saturday of the month. Um, for a Laguni, it's just $25 for an annual fee, $50 for a non-member. And then finally, the big program, um, I'm calling it an experiential education program. It's, I didn't want to call it a school because I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not quite ready to jump through the hoops of calling myself a school <laughs> and all those things. So it's an enrichment program, um, depend, separated by age group, um, but with an overlapping day. So your younger kids are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, older Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, I put an age range versus grades because the grade system is, um, I think an old standard that I'm not particularly fond of and we can have kids at different levels. <laughs> so it really depends on what their level is versus uh, what, their, what their grade is. Um, and, a lot of this stuff is on the website, but 
this is kind of how overall how I'm setting it up. And it kind of goes very well with what you're talking about, Tobin, and your Acton Academy of um, the way you set things up and how things are student led. Um, and it's again, starting local, going to global. And, and these are the benefits that it's student-centered, community-based. We have a lot of partnerships that we're working with to bring in some local information specifically on Florida. And um, it's facilitated versus taught, meaning no, no real lecture style, um, systems focused, so they can kind of see the greater picture instead of just learning about these different subjects and silos, there's real connection versus very fragmented information that we usually see in traditional models um, and it's sustainable. So going back to that idea of education never changing, this way of education allows for um, time to move forward and to be able to change and move with it instead of being very um, firm in what education is and what it needs to be for forever. It, it allows itself to be a little bit more flexible um, given with the times. And uh, these are some of the extra skills that kind of lend itself to that way of facilitation of that way of education. They're already kind of built into everything that we're doing. So it allows for a greater compassion, empathy, wellness, curiosity, problem solving, communication, conflict management, personal responsibility, and self-regulation. So we too do um, expectations. I have the groups. This is one of our Lagoonies groups. In the beginning of Lagoonies, we always set up expectations and I'm not building it. We give suggestions, but ideally they're the ones that come, are coming up with their expectation list or contract, um, whatever wording that we usually, I guess we're using the critter code these days. So we have a, a couple of like base rules, I guess, expectations, and then for the rest of them, they come up with those. So they have a sense of responsibility for them. Um, being taught as a facilitator versus a teacher, um, I'm very much in the sense of processing. I think processing is an art form that not a lot of people know about or do. Um, so we're not just talking about putting kids in groups and fig letting them figure out a problem. We're gonna sit there and take the time to like discuss how they worked as a team. How did they communicate? What worked, what didn't work? How can they work better together in the future? So then they're not only processing the actual content of what they're doing, but how they're actually working together and building that sense of um, understanding of themselves and how they work and how they work well with other people. Um, and how they problem solve and what they can do, uh, what they've done well and what they can improve upon um, in their next group project or interaction. Um, and then I've divided the year into two months at a time. I have these little letters here, North, East, South, and West, because they match up with the uh, sustainability compass, which helps expand um, some of these uh, topics a little bit more. So you can kind of break down their, it's nature, economy, um, society, and well-being. So you can take any one of these topics and expand it more in depth using the sustainability compass. And then I have a habitat specific for each of these categories or the, these month periods um, with lots of field trips outside. Um, trying to explore and get hands-on experience versus just learning about these things in a classroom. So that's kind of an overall view of what we do at Lake Worth Waterkeeper, specifically our Minnows and Mangroves program that um, it's kind of like a micro school. It's very much going to mirror uh, the school year with holidays and all um, built-in field trips. Um, lots of outdoor activities built into the program itself. So that's what that is. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. It was great. I've been listening to her ideas on how she's doing this for a while. So that was great. And this year, our micro school did the Lagoonies um, field trips. Once a month, we would pile all of us into the van and go on in a, a, a Lagoonies adventure. 
Some of them are really hot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's a part of Florida. You got to experience it. But I did want to make one more comment about okay. our programs. They're all very much, um, uh, we have a huge parent group. They're, they're like a, the biggest part of what we do um, and wanting to provide more resources for them. And I'm hoping, and we're talking more about it, but um, I'm talking with Caitlin down there with her brain pals, and I'm hoping over the summer she'll help me um, kind of close some of those gaps that I might have um, and to really fill out all of the programming. So, Excellent. Where do you Thank feel like you. your gaps are? as you're growing like what are your key gaps my gaps um i mean we've been running programming in outdoor environmental education so i'm uh, making sure i'm getting the the core the core things down like math and reading everything that we're doing is kind of folded in like we're, we're still going to be learning about this environmental programming. Um, however, there's going to be a history aspect to it. There's going to be a math aspect. There's going to be a literacy aspect. Um, and she's going to kind of help me in, in, cause I, I'm not, I'm not any traditionally trained in those areas. So I want to make sure, um, I'm hitting all bases and, um, her skills, allow me to do that. And they also allow the parents to get extra resources they need for their specific child if, because they're only with me three days a week. So if there is something that they need in addition to what it is that I'm providing, then they can do that at home because they're all still gonna be kind of enrolled as homeschool students. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. All right, so I guess it is my turn now. Um, I run a little micro school called Tapestry Academy, and it's going to be our fifth year starting this fall. I still can't believe <laughs> when I, I first had the idea of I'm going to start my own little school. My first envision was to create a private school because that was all I knew. I didn't know how that micro schools even existed. And then you hear the word and you start like researching. And I think I emailed every single micro school in the entire United States, asking them, you know, if they could give me tips and how did you get your location and all of those things. So it, it was quite a journey right at the beginning. And I even looked into Acton Academy. I thought that was really an exciting uh, model of things to do. Um, so anyway, it was a fun journey discovering micro schooling and I come from a homeschooling background my husband and I we have six kids so kind of like you Tobin uh, we've got large family and we didn't necessarily my husband and I weren't thinking hey we're going to homeschool because we were raised with you know, being public schooled kids you don't really think like that but my husband's mom happened to be an educator and that was all she would talk about is about education and what's wrong with it and how her kids are going to do something to make a difference in the future. So when it was time for us to start having kids, uh, it kind of evolved into homeschooling. And then at first it was scary. We didn't know what we were doing. And then you blink and it's 10 years, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's just how it works. And you, at the beginning, don't know what you're doing, but you get more skills and more connections. And then pretty soon you're doing one year, two years, three years. And I've discovered that micro schooling is the exact same way. At the beginning, you have no idea what you're doing, but you start researching and figuring out what it is that you're looking for. And then your ideas kind of evolve and change a little bit. You make connections and then you look back and you think, well, it's amazing the growth that I've had. I would never be where I am without have having this setback or that setback, but every single step along the journey makes you a better person. Um, with microschooling, it makes you a better business person because you're having to think about uh, business sides of things rather than homeschooling just involving your own family. So anyway, that was a little bit about my journey and we started Tapestry Academy with just my own children. I had, I think it was three or four. Before that, I did a um, a little once a week club, science club with Susie. We still remember your yoga classes. Those were awesome. 
So in fact, the kids were just talking about that swimming party we had at the end of the year. So that was really great times, but because of doing a science club once a week and classical education, and we did all of that at the community center, I was able to build those skills to, hey, maybe we should do something a little bit more involved. So when I made the transition from uh, just a super free, low cost science club to a, hey, I'd like people to pay me to do a micro school, it felt like a huge leap, but it did work out. And um, anyway, it was a really great experience along the way. I did change what we did starting from the beginning. So the first two years of doing Tapestry Academy, we did a different approach, you know, with hiring teachers and the whole nine yards. And then uh, I discovered that there was another way and we discovered uh, Prenda, which is a micro school program that's based out of Arizona. And uh, when I discovered them, I realized that I didn't have to reinvent the wheel or pay a million other people. And we've been doing Prenda for two years now, and we're going to start our third year in the fall. So in Florida, Prenda is a not free option. So um, in Arizona and New Hampshire, I believe they are free charter schools that are based out of people's homes. There's five to 10 kids and um, their program that they have works for pretty much anybody who wants to use their curriculum. So as homeschool family, could also use the Prenda curriculum and pay a monthly subscription to use their software, which teaches, you know, like math and English, and you have access to all of their project-based learning and collaboration ideas. Um, for me as a micro school owner, I, I do a group of five to 10 kids. Uh, sometimes we feel like that's a little small. And so I still incorporate my once a week science club, the Boca Buddies thing, so we meet up with others once a week at a park and get out of our little tiny bubble and um, have adventures, do the science Olympiad and different things like that. Um, so with any micro school, it's nice to have connections with other people, other places, other things. So connecting with, uh, I connect with the Be Ready micro school, which happens to be five minutes from my home. They are a K through two micro school and uh, I teach kindergarten through eighth grade. And people always ask all the time, how do you do the age groups? How do you have that many age groups and have it work? Cause they're thinking, hey, you all have to be nine years old to be able to have school. Hey, you have to only be a boy for me to hang out with another boy to have a school. Well, that's not true. And um, with the, the program that we use with Prenda, it's, they use mastery based things. So the kids are all going at their own level, whatever works for them. So they can either be ahead a couple of years in math, or maybe they're right on par in English, or maybe they're a year behind. It really doesn't matter where they are at, as long as they are making progress and where they're at. Of course, there's like base guidelines on this is what you would need to do for a school year to kind of get through. But ultimately it's up to the student and the parents what they end up setting for goals. Um, some of the kids have really, really surprised me. And I don't even, it, it, this is an incredible opportunity to just see what kids can do. So, hey, here you are, oh, I hate school. I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna do that. And then suddenly they've accomplished two years worth of math. What? That's amazing. So it's all just with uh, letting the kids be responsible and drive where they want to go. Of course, that does give a lot of times where they're like, I don't want to do that. But then that's why you're in a group setting. You see others working for goals and trying to accomplish things. And it kind of gives fuel to work a little bit harder or um, try a little bit more. Uh, one of the few things, no, not one of the few things, some of the things that I do enjoy are doing their create projects. I happen to be an art major that I got a bachelor in fine arts uh, once upon a time back from school. But I look back on that art degree now and I think this whole time that I went to school, I was training myself to see things that not others could see. So learning to create something every single day is something that not everybody can do. So if you practice those skills every single day, it gives you tools for creating your own business or creating something that just doesn't exist. And so I'm really appreciative of thinking like that and um, 
uh, Prenda has really taught me how to do that kind of stuff. I wanted to share a little bit this screen here. Their software is actually really pretty. I like it. The guy, Kelly Smith, who invented it, he was um, a coding guy. He was teaching coding classes at the library after school. And he decided what these kids are doing, like trigonometry on trying to come up with these really cool coding things. And he said, why can't we have a school like that where you're not being forced to only do, you know, fifth grade math? Why, why can't you learn trig? So anyway, this is what, what a student would see when they would log in, for example. And if you, they do four things every day. Well, yeah, that's true. Bonus time is kind of logging in if you go swimming or cooking or all of those extra things that is part of life. We count those as school hours too. So the kids need to do like five hours outside of our school time doing that stuff. But Conquer right here, this is where the kids kind of set goals. Um, they work on their math and language goals. They have a really cool way to keep their books on. So if you read a really cool book, instead of just saying, yeah, I read that, you can put it on the bookshelf, which is really cool. I'll show you this really fun because I just love seeing this. Hopefully it will show. So this here is their bookshelf of things that you want to read. And then, isn't this so awesome? This was our third grader. Look how many pages she read. Like she was just so stoked with the idea of having her pages counted. And anyway, that was really a motivating factor to just see her progress over and over and over. So um, anyway, that was one thing that I really enjoy. The writing, the writing was kind of an interesting thing. They just say they want you to write every single day and don't really critique it. Don't say anything at the beginning, just kind of get over the fear of writing. And the internal adult in me thinks, no, let me help you <laughs> with that. But I've actually seen the kids really learn how to write and get out of their shell by just having somebody give them some space to write. Now we do have times where we write where we're actually going back and revising and looking over and correcting things, but the goal is to just write every single day. Um, anyway, so, so those are some of the things from the Prenda software. And um, anyway, that's kind of what I do in a nutshell. I have a few openings left for the fall and, and that's kind of what sparked the whole idea of, hey, maybe we can start interviewing people, get more people to know about what's going on in the community because I guarantee I am not the only person out there looking for more students for the fall. <laughs> so now we are to our questioning um, part. I wanted to do some guided questions about non-traditional education and Maybe someone can answer, um, maybe I think, I kind of feel like I should open it up because we've got a few other educators in here too. It looks like Eric is from another, um, what are you called? Where are you from, Eric? Eric? Oh, right now, <laughs> San Diego, but <laughs> Florida. And uh, um, later in the fall and, um, I think we actually spoke on the phone, um, but I have a four-year-old and another one on the way. Oh, yes, um, I do remember speaking with you. Excellent. Well, so thank just, you. For yeah, just learning more about this world. And, um, you know, it's been excited to, you know, everyone today. I have to hop off in a minute, but I was going to ask, are there more of these in the next couple of weeks? Yes. So my plan is to do one every single Wednesday for four in a row. And then after that, I would just do them once a month. But my idea was to just get a bunch of them out there, record them, stick them out on our website so more families can learn more about um, non-traditional education, alternate education. My husband thinks there's like a stigma for alternate education, but I don't know. Maybe we can redefine it. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, sorry about calling you out last minute like that. Sorry. It's okay. I actually do education but more at the high school level and that's a separate conversation but it's been it's funny like being in that world and working with applying the college so much has really shown me all the benefits of alternative education models and so just learning more so for true. my own kids yeah. excellent thank you so, 
Thanks to so, everyone who presented. I, I often meet with the student. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Oh, thanks, Bye. Eric. So, I scared him. <laughs> so oh, you're good. Because you might <laughs> Oh, excellent. So maybe we can just discuss a little bit of um, why choose non-traditional versus traditional education. Does anyone want to jump in with their thoughts or ideas? I know that, oh, go ahead, Susie. Oh, I was going to say, I know that um, one of the reasons we chose it is just because it just seemed like a system that was broken. So it did seem like the chance to start reinventing, you know what I mean? So that's kind of why we started homeschooling. Don't so. they call that necessity is the mother of all invention? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I think Tobin covered a lot of it, uh, you know, the why of alternative education. But um, it's interesting that we, we say that the system is broken. And I just think it's a system for another time period. Like it worked during the industrial revolution. That's what it was. And they like put everybody in their little industrialized factory schools. And, and that's what, where it remained for <laughs> the time. Um, and we've just outgrown it, I think, as a society and um, all of the policy and ideas around what education should be and what it looks like are just outdated. And um, so they don't work anymore for us. And, and I don't think there's so many different answers of, you know, if you're going to take one thing away, like, especially in Florida, they're like, well, if you're going to take Common Core away, what are you going to replace it with? And that's kind of the, the ultimate question for education in general. And if you're going to remove what system is currently in place, what, what are you going to replace it with? And I think um, there's so many different, you know, alternative education is big. There's so many different things that people are doing and different frameworks. Um, I'm gonna have to look up Acton Academy because I haven't heard of it, but it sounds really interesting. Um, and there's just so many different things that people are doing here. There's so many different things that people are doing abroad um, to learn about and like bring back over here. Cause I, I feel like some countries are actually further along in this change in education than we are here. Um, so yeah, I, it's just a matter of education changing um, for what what it is today. And I, I just think it will, that change is not gonna be a big change on a government level. I think it's gonna be small changes on a local uh, grassroots sort of level, starting with these micro schools and enrichment programs and, and what it, whatever it is that people are creating to, to make something different where we are. I find that interesting too. I'll get phone calls all the time. Somebody will say, my middle school child is so stressed. They are doing four to five hours of homework after they come home at night. They're, they've got anxiety. I'm having to take them to doctor's visits to just talk about the anxiety. It's just so stressful. We need to find another plan. So I feel like, okay, I, let's talk. I've got a, a way to make it so that they can go at their own pace, don't need to be stressed. And then they'll say, oh, we've decided that the kids don't want to change. They like their friends too much. And so we're just going to stick it out. And I think to myself, oh, you just have to be willing to step into the darkness. If you can't step into the darkness, you're going to always be doing what everybody else tells you that you got to be doing. I think that's kind of the hardest thing right at the beginning is taking that unknown step. And maybe that's why I wanted to kind of demystify the whole micro schooling process, because there's a lot of us out there. If I felt like I was doing it all by myself in my own you know, little bubble, it would feel solitary and alone. But yet I know that there are lots of us out there and it just takes connecting one at a time, making that little relationship and realizing they're there to help you. When I very first started emailing people across the country saying, what is microschooling? Tell me about yours. Can you help me find a student handbook? I don't know how to make one. People were so kind and would email me and share things with a perfect stranger, give me tips about this, that, or the other. And I thought that's a really amazing um, opportunity to realize that we're all there to just help education change. It's not all about me. It's all about changing it. Um, maybe I can 
look at another question here. It says, uh, how did you get started on your journey? Does anyone want to share? Uh, Melissa, what about you? How did you get started in like non-traditional education? Um, I guess that was back in my undergrad. Um, I was a student facilitator for our outdoor program. So I was introduced to then, um, education was not my major. I was actually an art major like you. <laughs> and, um, and that really kind of changed my life. I was like a shy, timid girl. And then I did this facilitation and it required me to like talk to groups of people and lead them hiking and caving and uh, through our ropes course. And we talked about communication and team building and uh, leadership skills. Um, and we learned about John Dewey and he's like the father of experiential education um, and the lived experience. Uh, so I was introduced to that. And from there, um, I, I guess I didn't really imagine myself in education until recently. It's always been on the back burner, but um, I went to school a little for a little while in adventure therapy, which was experiential education mixed with therapy. <laughs> and I decided I didn't want to be a therapist and did the whole MBA thing and got linked up with uh, Lake Worth Water Keeper um, with their education program. So it's kind of been this um, experiential education has been this line that I've been following where it takes me. Um, and now I'm doing this and kind of um, and now I'm enrolled in the PhD program for sustainable education and really trying to have more of these conversations and get people to really kind of talk about it more openly about our education system and how we need to change it or how we can change it and where we can change it. Excellent. Tobin, do you wanna tell a little bit about how, how you started your journey? I will, I'm, I promise I'm not dodging that question, but I'll trade it for a question from the group. I think, I feel like I answered oh, a little a bit of idea. that and I'd love yes. to hear what you guys are wondering about. That's excellent. Does anyone have any questions? I did want to end with the last few minutes of questions from the audience. Thank you for reminding me. Hi guys. Hi. Um, I was actually interested in the process for each of your schools in enrolling. Um, specifically, I mean, we are actually more in the location of Tapestry Academy, um, but just in general, what is the process for each of the schools um, and selecting the students that are going to attend? Sounds good. Maybe I'll ask an answer just to get started, but you're welcome to jump in too. So for us, um, I do have, you know, a form to fill out. It just tells about a little bit about your background, but we don't require test scores or anything crazy like that. Mostly it's just a good connection. So if you're not going to meet with us in person, we just want to feel like it's a good click right from the beginning. And then we have uh, two letters of recommendation to just kind of make sure that we're getting what we're seeing you know it's always nice to say hey here's my amazing student and then they come and they're like I hate school I never want to do a single <laughs> project you know that could very well happen so just getting a couple of letters of recommendation and um, it's mostly just the click to tell you the truth um, anyway that's what it is for us does anyone else want to answer I'm, I'm happy to jump in, Melissa, and you want to, you, okay. Um, so I can only speak for our Acton. Uh, the other, it's this decision is made locally uh, by the other owners, what they're, what will be the best fit for their process. Um, we turn away uh, or do not invite, I should say, more than we actually, the invitations that are extended. And that's not a, um, what we're looking for is the fit as, as Candy described, and can we serve this family? So I mentioned one of the sort of filters. Um, my wife, Martina, does most of the introductory phone calls, and it's we share resources, and we expect families to go do the research that we did. <laughs> and if they're not willing to make that kind of commitment to the process, they're probably not going to um, be a good fit for the act. And environment because it's there's a lot of independence required of the 
learners and of the, so one of the interesting things about an act and the, you guys have probably heard of the hero's journey. Yes. Hero's journey is talked about almost on a daily basis inside an act and, and that hero's journey is true for each individual learner. We call them dragon knots in ours, but the, you know, it's the parents are on their own hero's journey. And when you start shifting that focus, uh, that the parents have their own uh, dragons to fight, so to speak, um, and, the, and the learners are going to do the same for themselves, then parents tend to not stop trying to live their lives through their children, which is often a big challenge uh, in, in Western culture. There's the, a lot of this pressure. So again, you know, there's that, that quote about power corrupting, absolutely. You know, most people, I would, I would have said, well, that's not, you know, I'm not going to be corrupt with someone like I don't see myself as morally corrupt, right? Well, here's what it looks like on a day to day basis. You're heading out the door, your six year old is trailing behind with the shoes untied, and you're thinking to yourself, it would be so much easier to just tie those damn shoes and get to wherever we need to go, <laughs> right? You, we've all been there. I, I see some of you smiling and nodding. I know you've experienced this. And when we rescue, we rob our children of those opportunities. So what that's really what we're looking on the, you know, is this family looking to make that kind of journey? And if so, we, we kind of lay out it's, it's uh, most of our folks that are reaching out to us have heard about acting before they come to us. And they, they specifically, they're looking to get into an act near them. So they might be talking, uh, Florida right now has a lot of folks moving in. So they're calling, you know, Tampa, they're calling, uh, you know, Orlando, they're calling Miami and saying, you know, what do you guys have? How do you function in trying to find the fit that way? And for folks that have never heard of it before, it's really, um, we'll answer questions because everyone has, you know, the, the sort of material questions. When do you start? What does it cost? All those things. What's the process look like? But it's really go read Courage to Grow. And you're either going to read that book and you're going to say, this is, this is for us. And now we can't imagine doing anything different or, no, thank you. I appreciate you opening our eyes. This is definitely not for us. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's funny. Go ahead, Melissa. Do you want to share? Um, I mean, to be perfectly honest, this is our first year doing that for the Goonies. We don't have, you know, it's a 10 week, once a week thing, but for men uh, minnows and mangroves, um, yeah, I, like Candy, I think it's 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 about fit, wanting the families to be aware that um, what we're looking for is a larger family. Honestly, it's a community. Um, getting the families to realize it's a family affair, and we're not just we're not just here to teach the children or here to facilitate them. Um, it's it's more about making connections between each other and with what we're learning about and why we're here. Um, so really wanting to understand um, what it's all about and and their their role in in the whole experience in the community that we're trying to build, I think is an important part of what we're doing. If if they just want to drop off and forget and and not. Um, be a part of that community I think that would be a poor fit but really just kind of understanding and being aware up front of, of whatever the, the child's needs are and if we can safely um, honor those and uh, provide for them what, what their needs are because we understand that we may not be able to fully um, help anyone or, or participate that we may not have the skills that necessarily that this child may need otherwise. Um, so knowing our own strengths and uh, where we are pitfalls, I guess, is also a part of that too. Excellent. I would just have to add that what Tobin said and what Melissa said is what I think too, you know, just understanding the philosophy behind the school working together as team and just realizing when you join a little tiny group that's a micro school, you're kind of committing to them that you're gonna be there. You're gonna be there through all the way through the end of the school year, because when you leave, there's kind of like this, oh, somebody left our little community. So it's not the same as joining a class where you're not really a, a known person or a face. You are a big part of what that is all about. So we are ending our hour time. I just want to say thank you so much to Tobin and Melissa for coming today, for everybody else who was willing to just come and sit in on the call. 
And uh, remind everyone, we're going to be doing these every Wednesday for the next three weeks to just get the word out about uh, microschooling, homeschooling pods, and non-traditional education. And we have our microschool showcase and curriculum expo coming up on Saturday, June 11th in Boca Raton. Please share the word. It's our first time doing it. I have a feeling it will be a really successful for those who are supposed to be there because it came together like it was meant to be. So we're just moving forward to have it happen. And uh, I look forward to doing more in the future. So anyway, thank you, everyone. I appreciate you coming.